I currently live in a little town out west. Well, I say town. Not exactly what you'd picture, though. It's more of a ghost town than anything, really. Population 4. The only businesses that are open are the post office, the library, a singular, privately owned pharmacy, a gas station, and a hotel. The Hotel Bella Muerte. I've worked there for the better part of a century, ever since I was 21. Unlike most kids my age who jumped straight out of high school and into college, I had other plans. Or should I say, other plans had me. I lived the town over from the previously mentioned one, a town that had far more people and businesses. I worked from place to place for a couple of years, nothing substantial, but it paid the bills. One day, I came home from work, picked up my mail, and headed inside my home. As I brewed a pot of fresh coffee, I absentmindedly flipped through the mail. Bills and junk were all I ever seemed to get, but then... I hit the second to last piece of mail and it felt, well, odd. It's hard to describe, but the letter was ornate, to say the least. It had a thick texture made from what I could only imagine was some pretty expensive paper. In the most beautiful, flowing script was printed my name, clear as day, Autumn Winters. It had no return address, and it didn't have my address either, just my name. The fact that someone knew me intimately enough to hand deliver a letter to me without knowing me was a pretty strange thought. I had very few friends because I grew up an army brat. Only a handful of people knew me well enough to actually know where I lived. Out of sheer curiosity, I then proceeded to open the letter. On the finest parchment paper, in the most delicate letterhead, read the following words. Dear Miss Autumn Winters, I am writing you to offer you the most prestigious position at our establishment, the Hotel Bella Muerte. For over 200 years, our establishment has been a haven for the weary and restless, the old, the young and the forgotten, and men and women and animals alike. Recently, we have had an opening for a new caretaker and would like to offer the position to you. The letter went on to say that along with the position, a hotel room, small apartment, came with a job, along with a salary four times what I was currently making a year. The name of the hotel seemed familiar, yet everything about the letter and position seemed too good to be true, like a scam of some sort. That's when I noticed at the bottom of the job was the address. That, my friends, was when my interest was truly piqued. It was only one town over, and that's when it all clicked in my head. The Hotel Bella Muerte. Ever since I could remember, there have been rumors and stories about the Hotel Bella Muerte. Strange tales that seemed too odd to be true. Tales of ghosts, strange travelers, and more. We heard the rumors, sure, but few people I knew actually believed them. The kids in the town I lived in would say that if you set foot in the hotel, you would be driven to madness and go loco. The tales were just so bizarre, how could we believe them? So, after a few days of deliberating, I wrote back accepting the job opportunity. I got a letter back a few days later to congratulate me and set the start date. I was to start the next Monday, around noon. As I got ready that following Monday, I put on my best clothes, did my makeup and hair, you know, the girly things, and tripped over thin air as I went to the kitchen to get my coffee to go. Then I got in my 1965 red convertible Mustang and made the short drive. On the way into town, I passed by, well, nothing. The land is completely barren outside the town I grew up in, except for the tumbleweeds, brush and bracken that looked perfect to start a bushfire with. Then the few twisted, gnarled elder trees that once stood tall, perhaps, but were now nothing more than sorry shadows of what they used to be. Think typical Western movie scenes. The town that held the hotel looked much more of the same, with run-down buildings that could barely be considered standing. The further into the ghost town you got, 
the more lifelike things became. The gas station was the first thing that looked like it held any living beings. The pharmacy was next, then the library, and then the post office. They were all about equal in size, looked just as run down as the other, with peeling paint that fell in ribbons to the ground when the wind was strong and was acting up. And suddenly I saw it for the first time. The Hotel Bella Muerte. Live and in person. And it didn't even compare to what I had in mind. You see, when I pictured it I thought of a rundown building filled with cockroaches and rats with only the lowest kind of people staying there. The kind of place that the police did stakeouts as to bust drug dealers and hookers. What other kind of place could be in this rundown town? But I was so, so wrong. The sight that greeted me as I pulled out to the parking lot of the place was one I could barely believe. The hotel was, in a word, magnificent. It looked like it belonged in a fancy city, not a barren wasteland. The outside of the hotel fit the town and the time period of the 1800s, with a high-rise balcony and white pillars that stood tall and straight. The brickwork was perfectly inlaid, faded red in color due to the wear and tear of time, yet still hardy in structure. I imagine it looked only a little better in its heyday, if nothing else than for its newness. Whoever owned the building took great care of it, whether in restoration or simple upkeep. It was something to see, for sure. As I got out of my car and walked up the front steps, admiring all the intricate woodwork that went into its structure, I looked above the front door and read the sign. The Hotel Bella Muerte, established 1802. I took the knob of the old door. No creaks or groans, and just silence as the door pivoted on its hinges and walked inside. Now, as impressed as I was with the outside of the place, it didn't even compare to what was before my eyes. As you entered into the lobby, the first thing that would come to attention was the grand staircase, made of beautiful mahogany wood, rich in cherry brown undertones, swooping as it dipped from its height down to the floor. And to the left, I became aware of the lobby desk. It was the same type of wood as the staircase, with intricate designs that swirled down its length carved out by some long-dead carpenter. Behind the desk were the letter boxes, with the numbers carefully and expertly placed in their centers, numbering from 1 to 15. The parlor was to the right. It looked as though it was frozen in time like the rest of the place, with old furniture with floral designs and high backs, and to the wallpaper that looked much of the same. It was stupendous. After I had gotten done admiring the lobby... I slowly walked over to the desk. No one was there, not a single soul. I rang the bell on the counter, yet no one came. And after a few more minutes of waiting, I called out a, Hello? And still, no one came. I began to wonder what I should do next. In our correspondence, I never got a phone number, despite noticing an old rotary phone in the desk near the letterboxes. Then I realized I actually never got a name of the person I was corresponding with. I didn't even know who my employer was. As I grappled with this realization, the phone began to ring, breaking the silence. I almost jumped out of my skin, scared shitless by the loud ringing in the otherwise quiet room. After no one magically appeared to answer it, it fell silent after the fourth ring, only to begin ringing once more. After regaining my composure, I walked around the desk to the back, looping around as I did so and feeling as if I were a child about to be caught with my hand in the cookie jar, and I picked up the phone. Uh, hello? I answered slowly. Yes, is this Autumn? Yeah, yeah, it is. Who's this? I'm the owner Mary, and my sister Martha was also on the phone, the voice said. Oh, hi, I said, stunned by the fact that the owners called instead of actually being there in person to greet me. Are you coming by, or are you here somewhere? Oh no, hun, we aren't there. We are never at the hotel. That would be ridiculous, Mary said as her sister Martha chimed in in the background. 
Oh, that is terribly ridiculous, she said, giggling. Ah, uh, okay, I said, now terribly confused. No, we were just calling to let you know there was a letter with your instructions for the job next to the phone and to let you know that we will be checking in from time to time. You are the only employee, and the last one of us left a bit, well, shall we say, unexpectedly. The last one? What does that mean, the last one? She said that as if there were a series of ones. Well, I take it that means I'm starting immediately then? We wouldn't have it any other way, love, Martha replied. Everything you'll need to know to run this place is in the letter. Just make sure you read everything and don't skip anything, Mary added. Then both in unison said, We'll be in touch, dear, as they hung up the phone. I was a little weirded out by the whole conversation, to be honest. It seemed so callous yet rushed, despite the cheery nature of their voices and reactions, and the weird pet names, of course. I looked at the table next to the phone. As the sisters had said, there was a letter. I opened the letter quickly with the ornate silver letter opener conveniently placed in the first drawer I happened to look through. Out from the envelope popped a long, and I mean two-foot letter, made of the same parchment as my offer letter. As I started to read, I became increasingly confused and worried. What had I gotten myself into? I thought. The letter started out normally enough. It outlined the general duties of the job, how to receive payment, $50 per night. Stunningly low, I thought, for a place such as this, but I've never been in the hotel business and I wouldn't know otherwise. The housekeeping, even down to the way they wanted the toilet paper changed, the wrong way with the paper going under the roll, but hey, who am I to judge? Last but not least was written a long set of rules that honestly made no sense. Written in bold, red print, was the following set of rules. Rule 126. Never forget to lock the doors at night. You don't want to let them in. Rule 127. Make sure you feed Jesus every night. Or else. Rule 128. Only take the trash out in daylight hours. Rule 129. Make sure you face the dolls in the doll room facing the wall at night. Rule 130. Don't ever take candy from the pharmacist. Rule 131. Never return a book late to the librarian. Rule 132. Always lick the stamps in the presence of the postman. Rule 133. Never ever leave the town under any circumstances or you'll regret it. And that was that. Not threatening at all or bizarre or extremely specific. Just a normal set of rules that made the place seem a little more... undesirable. Now I was really thinking I had gotten myself into something and not something good. And yet, I was thoroughly intrigued. I mean, what happens if I leave the town? Why did I have to lock the doors at night and who was them? Why did I have to take the trash out during the day and who the hell was Jesus? Nothing made sense. Since I was going to be here a while, I decided I might as well settle in. I looked at the letter again and at the end was my room number and then the envelope was my room key. Room number 16. It turned out there was one extra room in the hotel. After I got the key, I put the letter back into its prior place and I turned to walk up the stairs to explore what was going to be my new home. The doors on the second floor spanned three hallways and a dining room attached to a kitchen. Each room numbered 1 through 16, alternated going from the left side of the hallway and then adjacent to the room on the right and back again. The walls seemed to ever expand and contract at the same time if you stood in one place for too long. A dizzying effect, to be sure. It reminded me of The Shining, no thank you. As I walked the halls, reaching the dining room, I passed by and I could have sworn I saw a dark shadow pass by the half-open door, but when I looked inside, there was nothing. There were only the tables and chairs and waiting tables lining the walls. Strange. 
I saw it, but just shrugged it off and continued down the hall. Number 13, number 14, number 15, and finally, room number 16. As I jiggled the old skeleton key in its lock, there appeared to be a slight mumbling coming from the other side of the door. I promptly stopped to listen, but there was nothing. Not a single, solitary sound. So I proceeded to open the door once unlocked. My room, like the rest of the place, was absolutely beautiful. The queen-size bed with ornate canopy, all white billowing in the soft breeze from the open window. It stood in the left-hand side of the room towards the middle of the length of the wall. The small sitting area was to the right with a wardrobe, a small couch, and two high-backed chairs of the same make as those in the sitting room downstairs. The same floral patterns and everything. The open balcony windows were straight ahead. As I walked to them, I became all too aware of the mumbling again. I spun quickly around to see that in the corner of the right side of the room was a bird's perching cage. When I say bird, I don't mean a parrot or a cockatoo or even a parakeet or finch. What I saw sitting there was a raven, and it was talking. Just strange phrases and random words, but human words nonetheless. I began to approach the bird and it let out a loud squawk and began to flap its wings and flew straight into my face, blinding me for a second. Now, I think it would be fair to mention, for visual sake, that I hate birds. Yeah, 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 they can be pretty, yeah, they've got beautiful songs and musical notes that they chipperly sing out, and sure, they perhaps make good companions for some people. I, however... I am not one of those people, and I especially hate when they're little, or in this case, big flappy wings come flying in my face or near me in my visual field. So, of course, I screamed out loud, which only made it squawk louder with its horrible croaky voice. Then, as soon as it had hit me, it flew away. I took my arms down after a moment, once I knew it was gone, which had been trying to shield my face, and begun to look around the room. Not a bird in sight. Had I just dreamed that I saw that, or was I starting to go loco, as the many rumors from my childhood had said you would if you stepped inside the Hotel Bella Muerte? After calming down a bit, I began to shrug off the fear and replace it with determination to settle in and set up the room with my things. Once I had finished, at the exact moment I put the last pair of pants in the wardrobe, I heard a strange sound, a little ding. That's when I realized I heard the bell from downstairs. Someone was in the lobby. It took me a minute to realize what the ringing bell signaled. The hotel had its first resident. Well, not first, just the first since I got there. I quickly closed the wardrobe and headed down the long halls to the staircase. From the top, I could make out the outline of a man with his back to me. I assume he heard me coming because he turned just as I started descending the stairs. And it would be fair to say I was a little startled by his appearance. He must have been at least six foot four, perhaps even a little taller than that, with a grayish blue pallor to his skin. Dressed in a gray evening jacket and matching pants, shiny black leather dress shoes, and despite the warm summer day, oddly enough, black leather gloves. To complete the look, he also had a gray bowler hat. His frame was that of a walking stick, bigger around his middle with only twigs for arms and legs. His face was gaunt and long. The bags under his eyes had their own shadow. He had a slight bowing to his frame, as if the weight of his bones drug him down a little and he smelled strangely of sudden smoke. If I didn't know any better, I would have thought I was looking at someone who would have once belonged in Victorian times. Oh, hello, I said as I straightened my blouse and tucked a strand of auburn hair behind my ear. Good day, ma'am, he replied as he tipped his hat. "'Tis a fine afternoon for adventures, isn't it? "'Well, yes, I suppose. "'How may we serve you today here at the Hotel Bella Muerte?' "'I rattled off. 
trying to remember the exact phrasing from the rules in the letter. Ah, yes, well, if you would be so kind, I would like a room, my special room, if you please. I was a little confused, to say the least. This man had obviously been here before, but in the letter under the section that dealt with frequent residents, there was no one that seemed to match his description. Yes, sir, we'd be happy to offer you a room for your stay with us. In what name would I be putting on your door plate? You can put down Mr. Elberton, he stated as he straightened up to his full height. Mr. Elberton, Mr. Elberton. I searched my mind for the name, and then it hit me. Mr. Elberton. He was listed under rule number 78. Or was it 73? Anyways, he was listed somewhere in the letter. His note said, be sure to always give Mr. Elberton room number eight, and never accept his proposal for an adventure. I walked behind the man and around the back of the desk and wrote down his name on the door plate and grabbed the key to his room. After accepting payment from the man, which was oddly entirely in his quarters and all of them dated 1865, I walked him to his room which was thankfully at the end of the first hallway and handed him the key after opening the door. He took the key from my outstretched hand, every bone in his hands and arms creaking and protesting as he took it. Thank you kindly, ma'am, and if you are ever up for an adventure, come and see me, you hear? He said as he disappeared into the room, shutting the door quietly behind him. I was left in a state of what I could only call anxious bewilderment. There was nothing wrong with this man, other than he could have stood to eat a few hamburgers and drink some fattening milkshakes. Yet there was something about him that just seemed off. The whole situation since I first walked through the door seemed off for that matter, and it just kept getting more strange and unusual. I walked back down the hallway, and as I just almost got to the stairs, I heard a door open behind me. Thinking it was Mr. Elberton, I turned back around to see what he needed and was met with absolutely nothing. No Mr. Elberton, no open door, just nothing. It didn't quite hit me until a few hours later, after having Mr. Elberton frequently and excitedly come out from his room to invite me to go on an adventure with him at least a dozen times, that I was the only employee. And in being the only employee, that meant every duty in the hotel was mine to do. From the cooking and the cleaning, to the general front desk duties, to the entertaining and hospitality. Every single duty was mine to do. If that was true, and I knew it was as outlined by the letter, then why did I smell the most amazing smell of food that I hadn't smelled in a long time? And perhaps not since I had left home in my mother's good dinners. That's when it hit me that in the letter of all the literal hundred some odd duties outlined, not a single one said anything about cooking meals. But if I was the only employee, who made the food I was getting a whiff of? Maybe Mary or Martha was here? I quickly made it up the steps and turned at the end of the hallway and walked to the dining room where I found the source of the delicious smell. In the dining room on the tables was a full four-course meal. This left me stunned. Who had made all this food without me knowing or hearing them? I quickly walked back to the kitchen at the back of the dining hall to see if maybe there was someone there, but much to my dismay, there wasn't. The kitchen wasn't even dirty as you would have expected it to be. I walked over to the oven and felt the outside of the glass. No warmth radiated from the appliance. Now my anxious bewilderment turned into outright anxiety. How had someone gotten by me on the way to the dining hall and made this spread without my knowledge? Was it perhaps when I had been on my phone? That, that just didn't seem right. It would have taken multiple trips to have brought everything in and out and no one had passed by my desk. As I stood there floundering, I heard a familiar voice behind me. Good evening, ma'am. I startled a little bit and spun around to see Mr. Elberton behind me. Oh, good evening, Mr. Elberton. And a fine evening it is, too. 
I was chased from my room by this delicious smell and came to investigate. What do we have here? He said as he walked over to the first side table. That was the first time I truly bothered to look and actually see what was there. There was a salad bowl made of the finest crystal and then it was filled to the brim with what looked like a salad and to the right of that was a large baked chicken, baked to a golden brown perfection. Then there were the sides. There was of course mashed potatoes, baked potatoes, boiled potatoes, and potatoes au gratin, just about every kind of potato there is to be had. As if the cook just couldn't decide on one type of potato, so he just chose all of them. A big plate of Brussels sprouts, no thank you, and broccoli, green beans, and asparagus. Then there was that weird dessert type ice creamy stuff that is meant to cleanse the palate. And then last but not least, the desserts. Now, I love desserts as much as the next person, but the amount of dessert at the table was ridiculous. There were different types of cakes, multiple pies, dozens of pastries, but more than 14 types of cookies. I was dumbstruck. Everything looked and smelled wonderful, but who knows where any of this stuff came from. And did I want to risk it? I thought as my mouth would water with anticipation. I hadn't eaten lunch that day, so I was pretty hungry. Ladies first said Mr. Elberton as he motioned to the table. I think I'm good, not feeling very hungry at the moment. I lied. Suit yourself, Mr. Elberton replied as he began to dig into the salad. I watched as he made sure to get a little of everything, which was quite impressive to watch. I would have thought that his thin, bony arm would snap in two at the weight of the plate alone but he managed it without trouble and went to sit at the closest dining table. That's when he spoke again. Would you like to go on an adventure with me? He asked, raising an eyebrow. Now, this was easily the 16th time Mr. Elberton had asked me to go on an adventure with him. All the other times he asked, I always politely declined, and he disappointedly walked away. I was trying to keep the rules, and the rules clearly stated to never accept his proposal for an adventure. But in that moment, I had forgotten the rules. I was still freaking out over the food when I half-knowingly replied, Yeah, of course. That was when his face lit up, and it seemed that his face grew somehow longer, and a big toothy grin played on it, and he practically jumped up from his chair. At last... We shall have an adventure. And with that, he left his food on the table and reached out his big hand with those long, spindly fingers and took mine in his. And we took off. Down the hallways and down the stairs, out of the hotel and down the street. To what I would have considered the end of town. And then, for some reason, back again. Back down the street, into the hotel, etc., and then we went directly back into the dining room. Everything was as we had left it, except for the addition of at least 40 some odd people, all dressed similarly to Mr. Elberton in Victorian dress, chatting and laughing and overall having a good time. I entered the room with him and the crowd all stopped and stared, looking me up and down and I suddenly felt very uncomfortable. As people began to lean over and whisper to one another, Mr. Elberton began to talk. Good evening, everyone. As I'm sure you have noticed, we have a new guest with us tonight. Her name is... Oh, my dear, I'm quite afraid I don't know your name. Perhaps you can share it with us all. I... yeah, my... my name... my name is Autumn. I very sheepishly said to the large crowd. Ah, Autumn, a lovely name. We are all so pleased to meet you, Autumn, especially considering she is our new caretaker. And almost as soon as the words flowed from his mouth, everyone in unison began to look from each other to me, then back again, and to my surprise, everyone began to clap. Why they were clapping I didn't know yet. As soon as the clapping died down, one particular lady, 
dressed in a beautiful, deep red crinoline evening gown, stood and spoke. We are so very pleased to have a caretaker once again. It's our pleasure to meet you. It's our pleasure to have you. Now please, come and sit. Have a bite with us. I, no longer petrified by embarrassment and fear, walked over to the table where the lady in red sat and Mr. Elberton walked close behind. Sitting right where we left it, right where we had been sitting before, was his exact plate of food, still hot. He sat in his place and I slowly eased into the only empty chair left at the table. I still had no idea what had happened or how all these people suddenly showed up, but if nothing else, I was about to find out. Just what exactly happened? I asked the gaunt man sitting in front of me. We took a little trip, nothing more, nothing less. But how did all these people suddenly get here? It isn't like they were all hiding in your suitcase or just popped out of thin air. I said sarcastically. Oh, but they did. We all do. That's why life is an adventure. I rolled my eyes incredulously. What kind of game was this man playing and why did I agree to play along? That's when the lady in red spoke. Tell me, Autumn, do you like it here at our fine hotel? I guess I like it. I haven't been here but a day. Well, I think you'll come to like and maybe one day appreciate this place. I hope so too, but tell me, what are all y'all doing here and how did you get here so fast? She looked at me puzzled, then looked from me to Mr. Elberton. You didn't tell her? Well, I, I just assumed she already knew. Know what? I asked. The lady in red looked back at me and looked me straight in the eye as she put her hand on mine. This is a very special place, and that's why we are all here. You see, when this place was made, it was built on special land by a special man, and everything that went into the building was special as well. This hotel exists in this world for sure, yet at the same time it is not bound by regular logic and rules. Now I was even more confused than before. What do you mean it's not bound by regular logic and rules? This place is not in any one timeline, nor is it in any one place for long. It is everywhere and nowhere at once, and it exists only in the memory of those who have knowledge of it. That <laughs> makes no sense. Not a single part of any of that makes sense. Oh, but it does. In fact, you've already seen it for yourself, she replied as she gestured to the whole room. You just don't know it yet, but you soon will. I looked around the room. All the people were no longer staring and had gone back to whatever they had been doing previously. I found it hard to believe what the lady in red had said. None of it was what I'd call a normal thought pattern. It's not in any one timeline, nor is it in any one place for long. It exists everywhere and nowhere at once, and it exists only in the memories of those who have knowledge of it. That's when it hit me harder than a ton of bricks. I surveyed the room once again, looking at each person, the way they dressed, the time period the room seemed to be set in, and then I looked between the lady in red and Mr. Elberton, who both looked like they were awaiting the very question I was about to ask. What year is it? They both laughed then, looking at each other as they did. Once the laughter had died down a bit, the lady in red responded. Oh, you poor thing, you look as if you are a deer caught in a spotlight. You, my dear, are currently in 1856. And what a wonderful year it is, too, Mr. Elberton added. I felt sick. I felt sick. I felt dizzy my mind swimming with everything that had transpired in the last few moments. W what do you mean 1856? It's not 1856, it's, it's, it's 2013. It, it's June 25th, 2013. I know, I, I had it circled on my calendar in red this morning. How could we possibly have gone back in time in a few short minutes just by walking down the street? 
I directed my question towards Mr. Elberton. You said you wanted to go on an adventure, and an adventure is what I gave you. You don't always get to pick the destination, of course. I was dumbstruck. Here I was with a strange man whose first name I didn't even know. At least I didn't think Elberton was his first name, but who really knows? He had somehow taken me back in time, to 1856 apparently, and I had no idea how. And I had no way of getting back to my era. What was I to do? I slowly rose from the table, still looking to Mr. Elberton. I would like to go home, back to June 25th at precisely the moment we left. Mr. Elberton looked at me blankly, then slowly said, I can't. I snorted. What do you mean? You can't or won't? I can't. I can take you back to a similar time frame, perhaps even to the same week. But never in exact time. That's not how it works. Well, then take me back then as close as possible. and I want to go home. Home. Strange that in the few short hours of working at the hotel... I had come to consider it home. Very well, then, he said as he shook his head. Very well. He rose from the table and bid the lady in red goodbye and goodnight, and started to walk toward the door. As I rose to follow him, the lady in red called out to me. Goodbye and goodnight. I look forward to seeing you again, and I have a feeling it will be sooner than later. I nodded in her general direction and then walked over to meet the gaunt man standing in the doorframe. He took my hand once again and it was colder than ice. I shuddered just feeling it. He then did the same as before and dragged me from the room, down the hall and the staircase, and past all the buildings in town and toward the very edge. And this time I wasn't stumbling behind him and I saw him reach out as if he was grabbing something. Then he speedily ran us back to the hotel. Once we got back inside, he let go of my hand and walked around to the middle of the room. I looked around and to my surprise, no one else was there. No loud clinking of plates coming from upstairs, no loud idle chattering, nothing. I looked back at Mr. Elberton and asked, So, that's it? We're back? Just like that? Yes, just like that he said with a smile. I think I'll head up to my room for the night if you don't mind. Perhaps another day we can go on another adventure that's more satisfactory. In the meanwhile, I hope you rest well. Good night. And with that, he began his trek up the stairs. I looked at the grandfather clock in the lobby. It read 12.13 p.m. I didn't know how long I had been gone or what time we had left, but it was certainly late now. I decided to call it a night and head up to my room. But before I did, I finished locking up the other end of the night duties. I had had enough surprises for the night. I went up the stairs and down the long halls. The place seemed unfamiliar still, and that's when I noticed. Right there in the wall at the end of the second hall, a picture... To be more precise, a picture of the dining hall during some large gathering. The photo spanned the entirety of the room. At first glance, there was nothing remarkable in the photo. That's when my eye caught a floor-length crimson red dress. I took a closer look at the photo, and that's when I felt my breath hitch. The photo was like any other black and white photo, with the exception of the lady in red. Her dress was the only thing of color in the whole picture. Next to her in the photo on her right side was Mr. Elberton, dressed all in gray. But on her left was, well, me, complete with the out-of-style clothes for the time period and puzzled expression on my face. Under the photo was a placard that read, Midsummer's Evening Soiree, 1856. It took a couple more moments before my breath returned to a normal rhythm. How and when was my photo taken and by who? I didn't remember anyone having taken my photo at the evening party. I tried to shake the violated feeling I now had and turned slowly away from the photo. 
Continuing down the hall, I came to my door and I slowly opened it. After shutting and locking my door, I fell in a slump onto the bed. I reached over and set the clock to go off in the morning at 7 a.m. and laid there staring mindlessly at the ceiling. Before I knew it, my eyelids began to droop. Not realizing how tired I had become, almost as if I had walked a hundred thousand miles that day, I quickly fell asleep only to be startled awake by a loud thump. Thump. My eyes shot open. Thump. I quickly shot up in the bed. Thump. 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 What the hell was that? I got up quickly from the bed and tripped over my own two feet in the process of falling flat on my face into the carpet. I slowly stood, making sure that I hadn't broken anything and looked around the room, checking to see if anyone had seen my fall, but quickly regained my bearings and realized where I was and how ridiculous a thought that was. I straightened my clothes, smoothing out the wrinkles, and walked toward where I believed the sound had originated. Thump. The sound came once more from the other side of my door. Whatever was making the thumping noise had to be very large based on the increasing loudness of each thump. I paused, thinking about whether or not I wanted to open the door after all, but decided I'd rather find out who or what was making the noise, rather than stay scared and huddled in a corner of my room. With that, I reached out my hand, albeit a shaky one, and began to unlock and open the door, swinging it open wide. Clink. Something touched my foot. Shrieking and jumping back, yanking my leg away to shake off whatever had touched my foot, looking down quickly in the process. What the hell? I said quizzically. All that I had imagined in my head to be on the other side of the door couldn't compare to what was actually there, lying face down on the floor. It was a tiny doll just chilling and laying there. Not the monster I'd imagined, but what I would come to wish had been the monster after all. It was a petite, old-fashioned doll. I picked it up and began to look at it. It was an old, old doll, made from what I imagined was porcelain or bisque, with a white sleeve gown on like the one you would have seen in an old photo of a young baby in years past. The face of the doll was childlike with pink, rosy cheeks and wide blue glass eyes, and short, curly, honey-brown hair. It looked innocent enough. I would almost venture to say it was pretty if I was the sort of person who collected dolls, but I wasn't. I found them utterly creepy and weird. Now, who left you here? I asked, as if it would answer me. It didn't. It just stared back at me, unblinking. And where in the world did you come from? Still, no answer. I called out a hello, wondering if maybe Mr. Elberton left it for me as a gift. Though I didn't quite believe that he could have knocked on the door so hard with those bony arms. Plus, I wouldn't have described the sound as a knock. I was still half asleep and just wanted to get back to bed, so I decided I would pursue the mystery later on in the morning. Until then, the doll would be fine sitting in the chair in the sitting portion of the room. I set the doll gently in the chair and walked over to bed. Taking one last look at the doll, I laid back down and resumed my favorite sleeping position. Something was making me uneasy, though. I reopened my eyes and looked over to the doll, which was still sitting right where I left it, still staring, still not blinking. That's what I saw it. It was quick, hardly there, more of a flutter, really, but I swear I had seen the doll's eyes blink. I shot up once again, and being careful not to trip and fall, got up and walked over to the doll. I picked it back up and stared at it as if it was a staring contest. The doll won. I eased her back down, but this time I turned her to face the opposite direction to me in the bed. That way, she wouldn't keep giving me the willies. I walked over and got comfortable on the bed, closed my eyes, and started to fall back asleep. 
thump, clink. I jumped up. This time, the thumping was in the room with me. I looked to the floor, where the clinking sound came from and found the doll once again laying there on the ground. Surely, surely the thumps hadn't come from the doll, had they? I got up very begrudgingly, my whole body feeling heavy with sleep, and walked over to the now-fallen doll on the floor. I picked her up and gave her the once-over, nothing broken, nothing strange at all about her, just the same staring, icy blue eyes. I set her back on the chair and slowly walked backwards to the bed, and sat down on the edge, never taking my eyes off of the doll. If it was the doll making the noise, I was going to catch it this time. I must have stared at the doll for what felt like an eternity. Never blinking, never moving, no thumps or clinking, it just sat there. I decided maybe the doll was perhaps a little shy. Maybe I needed to look away from the doll for it to do something. So I turned to the wall facing the opposite direction. After what felt like a second eternity, I was about to give up. After all, the thought that the doll was the source of the noise was preposterous. It wasn't like the doll was a living being. Thump. I jumped and spun around. Holy shit! I screamed. The doll was no longer on the chair. It wasn't on the floor either. It had somehow moved and was sitting directly behind me on the bed. In my momentary fear, I accidentally knocked it off the bed in one swift kick. The room started to shake and a rumbling sound began to exude from every wall, crack, and crevice of the room. It felt like what I would imagine a small earthquake to feel like. I sprung forward and grabbed the doll from where she had flown off the bed and onto the ground. I grabbed it quickly and began to apologize profusely to it, sitting on the floor with it and back to the bed, hoping it would calm. After a few minutes of apologizing and nothing happening, I decided to change tactics. Maybe a few compliments wouldn't hurt anything? I told the doll how beautiful she was, despite the fact that I thought she was ugly as sin, and how much I liked her dress, the color of her eyes, etc. And surprisingly, she calmed down and the rumbling and shaking of the room began to slowly die down with each compliment. Soon, the rumbling ceased, as did the loud pounding of my heart. I continued to hold the doll for a few more minutes, and that's when the thought hit me like a car. I had forgotten a crucial step in the process of closing the hotel for the night. I forgot to turn all of the dolls facing the wall of the doll room. But where in the world was the doll room? I decided to take another more in-depth look at the hotel. I had no idea which room was the doll room, but I would find it before the night ended if I wanted to get any sleep at all. While still holding the doll, I got up off the floor, being careful not to drop the doll as I did so, and started for the door. After going to the front desk to get the master keys I left hanging on their hook, I decided I would start with the first room and work my way down the halls till I found the right room. I opened room number one. It was very unlike the rest of the hotel. The room was, top to bottom, jungle-themed. A mural was on the wall depicting a typical jungle scene. A jaguar in the top corner slipping down the front of a tree, eyes on his next meal. A beautiful bird with bright, colored plumage sitting on the forest floor. Other various birds looked on at the scene hoping that their fellow feathered friend wouldn't be somebody else's lunch. The skill with which the mural had been painted was exceptional. The room itself was filled with a number of different plants of all varieties, making the room even more jungle-like. As I stared mesmerized by the scene depicted, I became again all too aware of the little doll I held in my hands when it started to breathe. That's right, you heard me. The little creep began to breathe. I almost didn't even notice it at first, but the longer I stared into the room, the more labored the breathing became, as if the doll wanted to make its presence known and remind me of the current task at hand. I closed the door softly and moved on to room number two, at the opposite side of the hallway. I unlocked the door and opened it wide. 
Now this room was a little smaller than the last. The theme of this room seemed to be more modern. With a white deco flare, the whole room was, well, white. White walls, white furniture, white bed, you get it. Everything all sterile, unmoving white. The only things that gave color to the room were the various vases and china plates that hung on the walls with their splashes of cornflower blue hues. This room felt empty for the most part, like it was devoid of something that could give it life. I quickly closed the door and moved on, since there was nothing worth seeing here. Moving on to room number three, I looked down and noticed that the doll, who had remained breathing and blinking now, began to look to the side at door number three, and then back at me, those icy blue eyes staring a hole through me. I began to move far more quickly now, and panic beginning to settle in. Was the doll literally coming alive? If I didn't hurry, would the doll begin to talk and walk as well? What were its intentions for me? The answer to these questions I didn't know, but I wasn't going to plan on finding out. I swung room number three open. At first glance, this room looked like something you would find in a medieval castle. I couldn't help but stop and stare in awe at the craftsmanship of the woodwork that spanned the walls from floor to ceiling. The deep chestnut tones gave the room warmth as a fireplace lit up the whole room, which I found strange since I hadn't seen a fireplace anywhere on the roof of the hotel. I wanted to spend time in this voluptuous room, but now the doll began to squirm a little. I said a mental farewell to the room as I left its luxury and comfort and turned quickly to the next room. The room's placard read, Room Number 4. I quickly unlocked the door, rushing now to find the doll room and praying that this would be it. I didn't want to find out what this doll was capable of if it truly awakened from its normal repose. This room, unfortunately, wasn't it. It looked to be a room you would find in a dirty old cottage or perhaps underground hut. And unlike a hobbit hole, this room was a nasty, dirty, wet one filled with the ends of worms and an oozy smell and it didn't radiate comfort in the least. This particular room was very easy to leave behind and I did so as quickly as possible, turning my nose up at the stench that wafted from it. Room number five was different from all the rest. This room looked like my childhood bedroom, or rather the childhood bedroom of a young boy who was deeply into sports of all types and kinds. There were sports posters hung from the wall, dirty clothes strewn about the floor and every hangable surface. <sighs> Just like a boy, I muttered as I shook my head disapprovingly. This room also had a weird funk to it, which I attributed to all the dirty laundry and gym cleats about the place. It looked quite lived in, in comparison to the white deco room, but once again, this room wasn't the doll room. I shut yet another door, growing more frantic and disappointed that I hadn't yet found it. And perhaps I wouldn't in time and the doll would become alive, only to murder me in cold blood. At least, that was what my brain was telling me would happen, based on all the horror movies I had watched in my lifetime. At any rate, I didn't want to find out. I wanted to find the stupid doll room. Room number six. This one felt more promising for some reason. I mean, how many more rooms would I have to go through before I found the one? Five down and only nine more rooms to go, I said, not liking those odds once I had said them out loud. Well, I looked at the doll. Here's to hoping, I added, crossing my fingers. The room's door opened with a hurried and loud bang as it hit the wall. Straight ahead in the back of the room was a set of long, double glass doors, opened fully in the moonlight. I could hear the sound of gulls crying, being carried by the gentle breeze that blew through the open doors, fluttering the soft white curtains that surrounded them. The room looked like the upstairs bedroom of a beach house, complete with the widow's walk that lay just beyond the doors in the back. It was a peaceful scene, and for a moment it calmed my spirit, 
reminding me that everything was going to be okay. Then the doll started humming a jaunty little tune, reminding me everything was not going to be a-okay if I didn't hurry up and find the damn doll room. So I reluctantly left this room behind and moved on to room number seven. Please, 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 the doll room, I thought, almost uttering the words out loud but deciding not to in case the doll took offense a second time. I jiggled the key in the lock. Once I got that open, I went to the open door only to find it wouldn't budge. I bumped the door a little. Nothing. I tried to lock and unlock the door, hoping the third time would be the charm. Still nothing. That was when the doll uttered, Mama? Oh, hell no, I yelled as I decided to body slam the door. It took me three tries. Three tries, and on the third, I very ungracefully entered the room, similarly to how I had witnessed dozens of football players run into the opposing line of my high school football games. Now, in order for you to fully get the level of fear I was currently facing, I gotta break away from this narrative to tell a short story from my childhood. I loved dolls as a kid. Like any other girl, I had some 15 or 16 odd Barbie dolls and baby dolls growing up. I looked forward to Christmas and birthdays with the hope I could get another to add to my ever-growing collection. You might be asking yourself how I went from loving dolls to hating them with fervor. Well, I'll tell you. My stupid Aunt Mabel, that's what. She had a collection of every type of doll imaginable. Porcelain dolls, baby dolls, those cringy lifelike ones that people actually trick themselves into believing they're real, and my all-time favorite, ventriloquist dolls. When I would go over to her house for a visit as a little girl, I loved to ooh and ah at all the pretty dolls. My most favorite was one that wore a floor-length lavender-purple ballroom gown and had gorgeous dark brown curly hair that was tied up into a loose bun, and carried a small parasol that matched her dress over her left shoulder. She would even let me play tea party with a few. I enjoyed my time at her home and was always sad to go and leave them behind. Well, one summer, I spent three days at her house while my parents went on a couple's retreat. I remember being so excited. Thinking back on it now, it's almost unfortunate what happened next. When I got there that summer day, it was hot and sticky outside in the humid air. I was ushered into the cool and refreshing house by my aunt. She told me I would be staying in the back bedroom, which was technically the front of the old Victorian house since it faced the street, but my aunt only lived in the back end of the house for some reason. The only reason I could remember was because the back of the house had air conditioning and the front didn't. Anyways, I took my little suitcase and hurriedly and excitedly took it to the back of the house because that was where she kept her doll collection. I was thrilled to be in the back of the house where the dolls were. I just knew my aunt would let me play with them every day. After I had placed my suitcase in the room, I turned around gleefully to see my favorite doll. However, there was a new face sitting next to where she was, higher up on a stack of boxes. Sitting there was a ventriloquist doll. It was one of those Charlie McCarthy dolls that had been super popular in the 1930s. I had, up till that time, never quite seen a doll like it. Surely I had seen other ventriloquist dolls before. My aunt had several in the attic where I was never allowed to go alone, but this one was different somehow. It was dressed to the nines in a fancy black tux with coattails, a monocle, and even a sly, wide, toothy grin. And to complete the look, he even had a black top hat. His eyes were open wide, and I felt a little uneasy under their leering glare. As I stood there staring at the doll, my aunt had unknown to me, walked up behind me. Do you like him? She asked, giving me a scare. Uh, I, I guess so. What's his name? His name is Charlie. He's my newest little friend. 
She always called her dolls her little friends as if that somehow made them more real and her less lonely. I just got him in yesterday along with a few others. He is very special. He can talk and move on his own. My eyes grew wide with the thought. If he could talk and move on his own, did that mean he could walk as well? And Mabel, I ventured. Can he walk too? Well, you never know, but it'll be when you aren't looking and you least expect it, she said with a suggestive wink. Now, in my childish mind, the thought of a walking, talking, moving doll about the same height as me was terrifying. I loved to play with them and make up stories with them, but if any of them began to move or talk on their own, let's just say I wasn't too keen on the idea. But that wasn't the only reason I would come to hate the doll. That night in my aunt's home, after I finished brushing my teeth, I walked down the hallway to my bedroom. I had spent most of the latter part of the day in the front of the house with my aunt baking cookies and making dinner, then watching my favorite movie at the time, Beauty and the Beast, while eating in the living room on TV dinner trays. Now that it was night and the sun had set, the world was dark and quiet out except for the electric hum of the street lamp that sat directly outside the door. As I turned to head into my room for the night, I instinctively turned to take a look at the dolls just as I had done a hundred times before. Except this time it was night out, and I had never seen the dolls in the dark before. You see, there was a window that sat just above the door. A green stained glass window with flecks of red intertwined with the green, and blue edges that made the colors pop. The window was beautiful in the daytime, and equally so in the night due to the street lamp that shone through. As I turned to look once more at the dolls, I found myself absolutely horrified. The reds, greens, and blues from the stained glass window gave an eerie glow to the room, depending on where the color light shone. It glinted off the doll's glass eyes, gave their skin an unnatural, sickly pallor, and bathed the room in a kaleidoscope of hair-rising hues. I surveyed the room, my heart pounding and my palms becoming sweaty. My eyes finally rested on the largest doll of all, Charlie. As the light came through, it made his eyes look as if they glowed green, his skin only perpetuated by the villainous look and the boxes he sat atop seemed to only make him seem bigger in the dark. I froze with fear and remembered the words of my aunt. He is very special. He can talk and move on his own. Better to be when you aren't looking and you least expect it. I stared, stopped in my tracks and unmoving. How could I take my eyes off of him if he would just move on his own the moment I stopped? My aunt came back to tuck me in and glance from me to Charlie. He is wonderful, isn't he? She said, almost in awe of him. Then she quickly ushered me to bed, but I never took my eyes off of him until I rounded the corner. She tucked me in and gave me a kiss on the forehead and said her good nights and see you in the mornings, then turned off the bedside lamp and left the room, closing the door behind her. As soon as I heard her footsteps fade, I turned the light back on. I sat up in bed, never taking my eyes off of the door. I thought perhaps if I didn't turn off the light and kept my eyes on the door, even if Charlie opened it, he would simply drop to the floor the moment I laid eyes on him or be frozen in place as if I had been Medusa from Greek mythology. Either way, I made up my mind not to fall asleep that night. It only took an hour or two before I began to droop in the bed, my back becoming tired from sitting so alertly. I was so tired, but I wasn't about to let Charlie catch me unawares. I looked at the clock. It read 10.47 p.m. It was only a little over an hour past my bedtime, but I had played hard that day and fear has a way of making you tired after a while. I straightened up in bed, determined not to fall asleep. That was when I noticed a new sensation. My bladder was making itself known. 
I decided to hold off as long as I could before making the trek to the only one of the two bathrooms in the whole home. There was one in my aunt's room and one completely on the other side of the house. Either way, I was going to have to move past the dolls and Charlie to get to one. I waited for as long as I could, holding my stomach and trying various sitting positions to relieve the tension that was beginning to band around my lower abdomen. After what seemed like an eternity, I felt like I was going to explode if I didn't hurry to the bathroom, and I, being a self-respecting five-year-old, refused to wet the bed. I got out of bed and walked to the door. I stood there listening for a while, but heard nothing. I decided if I opened the door fast enough, I could prevent Charlie from rushing me or coming into the room, which in my mind was the only safe space in the entire house. I jerked the door open, and Charlie still sat perched upon his box looking more menacing than ever. I skirted down the wall, never breaking eye contact with him. Maybe it was a trick of the light or maybe it was because I was so tired but I swore I saw him blink. And terror filled my tiny frame. I should have just wet the bed. I sprinted down the hallway on tippy toes, almost playing a game of hopscotch as I went, and trying not to wake my aunt stepping on all the creaky boards along the way. I'm sure, thinking back on it now, I looked quite comical, but at the time, I was just trying to survive the night. As soon as I got to the bathroom, I quickly shut the door and turned on the lights. I listened at the door for the sound of footsteps following me, but heard none. I quickly relieved myself and prayed a silent prayer before heading back down the long hallway. I faced forward, glancing anxiously to and from every possible hiding spot in the house, thinking that Charlie may be hiding in any one of them and praying he wasn't. I got back to where the dolls were and peeked around the corner. Charlie was still there, leering as he ever did. I skirted back against the length of the wall that led to my room and closed the door. Walking backwards to the bed, I never took my eyes off of it. I sat up all night that night. Whenever I thought I was getting too tired to keep my eyes open, I would hear a creak or a groan. And I just knew it had to be that horrible doll walking around outside my door. I got up the next morning with bags under my eyes and a crick in my back and opened my door. There was Charlie, looking like he hadn't moved even a little bit. But I knew in my child's heart he had been up all night with me. I spent every night at my aunt's house like that. Propped up in bed, staring dumbly at the door, snatching quick naps during the day so I could stay up all night. And by the time my parents came to pick me up, I imagined I looked pretty rough. My parents said nothing in front of my aunt, though my mother eyed me suspiciously, and I was grateful for that since I didn't want my aunt to know what had transpired and seem ungrateful for her hospitality. When I got home, though... I told my parents of my ordeal, crying my eyes out as I did, falling into a deep, deep slumber after a short while. Needless to say, my parents didn't let me spend the night at my aunt's house ever again. And to my knowledge, my aunt never found out why. Now, this memory flashed in my mind after I came barreling through the door. Once I had regained my bearings and had a chance to look around... I saw I had found the doll room at last. The name implied that there would be many dolls in this room, hence the name, but it hadn't hit me until that very moment. From floor to ceiling were rows of shelves hanging on the powder pink walls. As I stepped further into the room, I noticed that on these shelves were various names. On some of the shelves, dolls still sat atop them, each name belonging to a specific doll. All had a first and last name, and each was unique and dainty. I turned about the room at the middle, glancing from doll to doll. Lisey Bell, Eleanor Rose, Mary May, Clarence Starling, and so forth. All of them had names. 
Then I noticed to my utter shock and horror that unlike my aunt's little friends, they were all moving, all breathing, blinking, and some of them were even talking in hushed tones, just like the doll I now absentmindedly held in my arms. I stared at them as they stared back, never once moving an inch. And then I noticed something else. There were spaces on the shelves. I quickly read the names Annabelle Lee, Hattie Joe, Lily Ann, Augusty, Huckleberry Finn, and Augustus Jones. Seven, seven were missing. Where in the Sam Hill were they? I began to panic even more than I already had. My heart close to bursting was pounding so hard. I whirled around when I heard a bubbly little giggle. Standing there were five little dolls. Three boys and two girls. One pointing at me as the others giggled and two looking curiously out the door. Apparently, they had heard me coming and sought to fortify the door lest I interrupt their fun. I wanted this to stop. I wanted to be anywhere but in that room. I wanted so many things at that moment. But we rarely ever get what we want. Now do we? I tried to think of what to do, but I blanked. I knew for sure that I didn't want them getting out of the room, and so I decided that the first order of business was to close and lock the door, which I did post haste. The next thing I did was close my eyes and stop to take a breath. Easily the first one I had taken since I had gotten in the room. I didn't need to be passing out, that wouldn't do me much good. Then I remembered the rules to which I now clearly regarded as my survival guide. The rules clearly stated that I needed to make sure you face the dolls in the doll room facing the wall at night. Why that helped anything or did any good, I didn't care at the time. I just wanted to get those dozens of eyes off of me and looking at the wall. I hoped if I could face the dolls on the shelves towards the wall first, I would have more luck. So that's what I did. As soon as I faced the first doll to the wall, it was like turning a switch. The doll stopped all movement. There was no breathing, blinking, staring, rumbling, thumping, or clinking. The doll simply froze. Now that I was close to the wall, I got a better glimpse at the wallpaper. And something caught my eye. On the pink wall, there was written words, left to right, top to bottom, all over the paper. After studying them for a moment, it looked like the language they appeared to be in was Latin. I didn't know what the words meant, but things written in Latin are seldom ever a good thing, especially in weird, enchanted, logic-defying, time-hopping hotels like this one. I scrambled now to turn the dolls to the walls, the song, Get Low, playing in my head as I did so. I finished quick enough, but that's when the empty slot seemed even emptier. I turned my attention back to the dolls, which were now closing in on me. I had no idea which doll was which, but I didn't care. They were going on the shelves one way or another. I swooped at the first girl doll and shoved it in the closest slot, facing the wall, and then I grabbed the second. I shoved it in the next available place and began to reach for the next one, a boy this time. When the room began to rumble and shake, I dropped the doll I had just grabbed and spun around. The doll I had just placed had spun its head around a complete 180 degrees, looking at me disapprovingly. I grabbed that doll back off the shelf and the rumbling stopped immediately, and his head returned to normal. I tried the next spot on a different shelf and once again the rumbling began. I grabbed it back off, maybe this was the doll's way of saying it was the wrong place? I kept trying slots and on the fifth try, the room didn't rumble when I placed it. I kept this up until the first one, the one from outside my door had been placed. I took another last look at the doll in my hands, then up at the shelf. Huh, so you're Annabelle Lee then, I said to myself. I placed her in her spot, then stood back to look at the room. Now remember how I said there were seven empty slots? I was never very good at algebra in school, but in simple math I was a pro at. There had been only five dolls on the floor and one in my arms. All the rest had still been in their places. 
I turned to look at the corner of the room. There was still one empty slot left. On the third shelf from the floor, at eye level first in the row, was the seventh empty slot. I groaned and hung my head low as I walked over to it. With a deep sigh, I looked at the name on the spot. I was prepared to go hunting this missing doll all throughout the hotel if need be, but I would at least know the name of the doll first before I went hunting for it. My eyes grew big, my breath hitched, and my heart stopped. Written on the shelf in front of the last slot was the name Autumn Winters. I spun around and ran from the room, slamming and locking it behind me. Why was my name there? What did it mean? Were all those other dolls once real people too? A thousand thoughts ran through my head. As soon as the key clicked in the lock and I gave the knob a quick turn, just to make sure it was locked, I then ran down the hall to my own room, slammed the door, not caring if I woke Mr. Elberton and locked my own door. I looked around the room and grabbed the nearest chair and wedged it into the door. Nothing was going to come for me tonight. I practically jumped onto the bed and stared at the door, listening for any and all movement on the other side. I must have stayed there for hours, unmoving, hardly blinking. About the time exhaustion set in and my eyelids began to slowly close, I heard a rapping, as if someone had been tapping, tapping at my balcony store.